All right, you guys can grab your seats. I'm really excited this morning. I've been going through a lot of scriptures. And it's amazing, there are so many scriptures out there that talk about how good Father God is, but yet 99.9999% of people believe that God is bad. So I used to be one of those people that used to believe that. Um, and not directly, I mean, obviously I thought God was good, but based on what I believe that what he did and what he allowed to happen, um, and the things that I was saying about him was not good. And for me, I'll, uh, growing up in a religious setting, I was taught from the beginning of my life that everything that happens, you know, God allows it to happen. So if I'm bad, God's going to punish me. Bad things are going to happen. And so I was really confused. And I think a lot of people are still um, the same way today. And so we're going to go through some scriptures and just kind of cover all of that and just kind of um, see what the Bible says, what the real truth is, because the Bible says that the truth sets us free. And it did for me. I remember when I was, I think I was 29. So yeah, when Simon was born, I was, uh, when he was a small baby, we had this little rocking chair. And so I would come home and Natalie was tired. So she'd go to sleep and I would take him and I would just rock him at night uh, in this rocking chair. And I would just, he would fall asleep and I would just rock and just look at him and just, just it was very, brought me a lot of pleasure just to look at him, stare at him. And I was doing that, uh, God started speaking to me and he asked me a question. He said, how much, how much do you love Simon? And I said, I can't even explain it. Like I can't, you know, it's like just Xfinity or whatever. I mean like un, unexplainable or unmeasurable amount. And then he said, who created you? I said, you did. And the next question he asked me, how do you think I feel when my children, who I created, think that they can love their children, but yet they accuse me of all of these bad things? And then he started showing me what I was experiencing was a little tiny drop in the ocean. The love that I can experience on this earth is a tiny little drop of how much he loves us, how much love he has, because he's the one, he's the creator of love, and we're experiencing our ability to experience love is very, very tiny compared to his. And yet, most people say bad things about him. And from that night, I mean, I cried that whole night and then I made a clear decision. I actually, I repented and I said, Father, I forgive me for saying all these bad things about you in the past. And so I decided for myself that for the rest of my life, I'm gonna speak how good Father God is. And um, I'm kind of a logical kind of guy. And I thought, so if I have to repent, I'd rather repent to him and say, I'm sorry that I said that you were good versus I'm sorry that I was saying that you were bad and accuse you of all these bad things. For me, it was just, it just made sense. Like if, if I have to gamble, because there are some scriptures that are, you know, like, you know, that you have, you like, if you don't look at it in perspective, if you don't look at it in context, you can see where God m- might have allowed some things to happen. But I decided for myself that I will believe that God is good and he is the best father we can have. And so that's been my decision. And ever since I did that, my life became very easy. Because when I started ministering healing to people, what would happen is I would start praying for somebody. And immediately, if I didn't get a result, immediately I would get, the devil would give me a thought, well, like maybe they have a sin in their life, or maybe there's something wrong with them, or maybe I'm teaching them. And so I always had this battle. And until I settled it, it was really complicating to be a Christian. And so once I settled it, it became easy. I never have to wonder if God is good. And so that set me free. And so I encourage everybody here today, just make that decision for yourself that God is good. He is a good father. He's an amazing father. And so you can never go wrong believing that Father God is good. Amen? So um, that's what I want to encourage everybody. So we're going to start out. I got a lot of scriptures to go through. 
I purposely did not bring my Greek Bible because we get stuck on the first one for the rest of the service. So it was very tempting to bring it, but I left it at home because I want to go, go through a lot of scriptures just to show uh, what the Bible says about this. So if you have your notebooks, I encourage you to write it down. So we're going to start out with, um, first we're going to go to, oh, I see Tim changed my page. We're going to go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. And it says here, So this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So I love how the scripture just uses like very bold statements. It uses really bold words to where there is no gray area. It's very black and white. So it says that we heard this message from who? So uh, Apostle John, he heard this message. He received this message from Jesus. Um, and it says that God is light. And so I'm an electrician. And so I know one thing, that if I come into a dark room, every single time that I turn on the light and light turns on, Darkness never stuck around. Has anybody experienced where you turn on the bulb and you can still see darkness? No, it's not possible. So in the presence of light, darkness cannot exist. So Jesus was showing to Apostle John that when light, that God is light. So therefore, in the presence of light, there is no darkness. And so that, is, that was the revelation, and that's the revelation that we need to have as individuals, to see God as light. And everywhere God goes, or where everywhere God is, because he's present everywhere, um, there's always light. So the correct way to say it, everywhere we go as children of God, because we are light, darkness has to flee. And so what I'm training myself is as I'm going, anywhere I'm going, as I walk into the room, darkness goes. As I walk into the store, darkness goes. As I touch a door handle, Whatever sickness, disease is on it, it dies. Why? Because I'm light. So I never have to worry about something jumping on me. Why? Because the light and life that I have inside of me that I have through Jesus Christ is always coming out and killing, destroying everything that's not supposed to be there. Everything that's of death is going away. Why? Because in the presence of light, there cannot be darkness. So, and it says, no darkness at all. So it's very clear. So if it says no darkness at all, how much darkness can there be? Zero. Okay? So it's very clear. God is 100% light, no darkness. He has nothing to do with darkness. So a lot of religious people, they say that God works with the devil somehow, that they work together, they're partners. Uh, devil does some work for God on the side. God helps a devil. So all of that is Eastern religions. When you look at scriptures, it does not say that. It says no darkness at all, zero. What is the devil? Is there any light in the devil? No. Devil is all darkness. So when the Bible says that there's absolutely no darkness, that's what that means. There is no darkness in God. So in, just allow the Holy Spirit to ingrain this into you that anything that's dark has nothing to do with God. Any sickness, any disease, anything that's going on in this world that is not light is of the devil. And it makes it really simple. I never have to wonder, is God allowing it or he's not allowing it? I just decided for myself to believe what the scripture says. God is light. So everything that is good, everything that is a blessing comes from above, from God. Everything that's bad is from the devil. And it makes my life really easy. I never have to guess. I never have to wonder to see what's going on. It's very simple. Dark, devil, light, God. And it, it just simplifies my life, and I think it will do the same thing for you. So next scripture is James 1. And we're going to start in verse 13. So it says, Let no one say, when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. So this is what God is saying. God is saying, that please don't say that when you're tempted, that you're tempted by God, by me. No. God does not tempt. For God cannot be tempted by evil. 
So God does not have the ability to be tempted by evil. So God does not even have the ability to have anything to do with any evil. Nor does he himself tempt anyone. 14. But each one of one, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and entices. Then when desire has conceived it, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. So the things, the bad things that we're experiencing, the sin, the stuff that we're doing, that's on us. It has nothing to do with God. When we listen to the devil and allow that thing to conceive and to grow, uh, it starts developing and we fall to it. God has nothing to do with it. So if we choose to go the path of the devil, if we choose to believe what the devil says, then there is nothing, God has nothing to do with it. Why? Because God is light. So when we walk away from light and go into the darkness, then we are responsible for that and God has nothing to do with it. Because many times what we hear is somebody gets themselves into trouble and they say, oh, God allowed this to happen for me to go through this valley or for me to get stronger, to, to grow. So I fall into this thing and you know, I experience this, uh, this desert or whatever this nonsense is. That's what it is. It's nonsense. God has nothing to do with temptation. God has nothing to do with sin. It, he is clean of it. because Why? Because he is light. So there is no temptation. There is no darkness. There is no evil. And he has nothing to do with it. 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. So, again, it uses very clear. Is it partial? Does God just do partial good? No, it says every good gift comes from where? From above. So can the devil ever give you anything good? No. You might think that he's giving you something temporarily, but eventually it will destroy you. So the devil tries to sell us that he's going to give us something good, but at the end, what is it going to do? It's going to bring death, because everything of the devil eventually leads to death and destruction. Why? Because Jesus said, I came to give life, life abundant, and the devil came to give, he came to steal, kill, and destroy. That is the only thing that he's capable of doing. He is not capable of giving you anything good that will last. He gives a lot of fake stuff that it seemed like it's going to last, but it can never last. Eventually, it brings death. And so, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. So, if somebody gets cancer, for example. Is that a perfect gift from above? No. Then why do people say that God allowed this to happen or God gave me this cancer to learn something? Can we ever say that? No. We can never ever say that. Based on these scriptures, we shouldn't even have a thought to come in that. But see, when we're confused and we're wondering like if God is good or God is bad, then it's easy to believe that. I'll admit, I used to believe that God, every time that I would mess up, if I didn't listen to my parents and I would get sick, I believed, because that's the way I was brought up, is that came, God gave me that sickness. God put that on me for me to repent. That's what I used to believe. I can't believe that I used to believe that, but that was the truth. Like, I'm not ashamed to admit that. So that was the lie that I used to believe. But it clearly says here that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from Father of lights. Who's Father God? So he is only capable of getting us good gift, and not only good, but perfect gifts. So for those that get a birthday gift or a Christmas gift, you know how sometimes you get like, oh, you know, this is good, but then you get this one gift, and it's like, this is perfect. The best gift that you get, perfect gift, those are the kind of gifts that God gives. He doesn't even give you like a partial gift or like or a half likable gift. He always gives you perfect gifts. And there is nothing perfect in something that brings you torment, torment that brings you destruction, where your life is getting destroyed, where you're getting hurt. There's nothing perfect about that. Amen? So again, really important to understand that all evil all darkness, everything that's bad, everything that's destroying your life is coming straight from hell, from the devil. And God has nothing to do with it. Unless it's perfect, unless it's a blessing, unless it's life and life abundant, 
That is the only thing that comes from God. Everything else that's evil, that's destruction, that's stealing, killing, destroying, that's coming from the devil. And that's it. And there's, there's no, there's nothing gray about it. It's either one or the other. With whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And that's another thing. He said, so not only does he say that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, it comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't sit there one day like, hmm, like today I'm going to give this guy bread, tomorrow I'm going to give him a rock. No, he never, he never changes. Once he's decided that he's going to give you bread from the very beginning, that's all he's going to give you. He's only capable of giving you good stuff. Amen? That's why he's an amazing father. That's why I love, it's so easy to talk about how good father God is. Why? Because it's all in the scripture and it's the truth. Because that's who he really is. He is a good father, amazing father. The best father that you can ever imagine, that's who Father God is. And even beyond that, beyond your imagination, beyond your thoughts and how you can see him, the best way you can imagine him, he's way better than that. Why? Because he's Father of light. He's, he, his goal is to give us gifts, perfect gifts, perfect blessings, and to bless us with every heavenly blessing. Of his own, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So what this verse says here is the way that he's able to get all of that to us is by his word of truth. So when we agree with the truth of what this word says, we're able to receive everything from him. So if we don't know what the truth is, so for example, if I used to think that if I had stomach pain, that that was coming from God, that's all I was able to receive. Once I figured out that that's a lie and replace it with truth and replace it with Isaiah 53, where it says, by his stripes I was healed, then I was able to receive that. I was able to receive healing. And I never had stomach issues since. Why? Because I received the truth. And so by the truth of the word of God, he delivers these gifts from above, this perfect gift that he has for every single person. And so we have to agree what he says and replace those lies that we believed before with the truth. And so this is something that I'm growing in myself. And the more of this truth that is in here that I receive and I allow it to be in me, the easier my life gets. Because if I believe sickness was the way for me, I got that. Now I believe life and health is for me. That's a way better deal. Before I used to think, you know, fear and oppression and torment was what the way of, you know, part of my life. And I decided, wait a minute, that's of the devil. God has nothing to do with that. God doesn't torment me. And I said, that's it, no more. Jesus said, have peace. And so instead, I just decided, okay, going forward, I'm going to have peace. And I agree with his peace, and my life has changed. I no longer, I'm no longer tormented. I don't have fear. I don't have anxiety. Why? Because I choose to believe the truth that says that I have his peace, and I have the fullness of his peace. Not only do I have enough for myself, but because I have abundance of it, I can even share it with others. Everything that we have, Jesus said, you have life and life abundant. You have enough for yourself and enough to hand out to everybody around you. That's how good God is. That's how good and perfect his gifts are. That they're not only satisfy you, but they also satisfy if you're willing to share them, if you're willing to experience yourself, that you're able to hand them out and give them to others. Amen? All right, so... Next one, let's go to John, chapter 14. And so this scripture really helped me because um, there's a lot of stuff in the Old Testament that we might not understand because of the different covenants. And so when I was learning the truth, what really helped me a lot is the scripture I'm going to go right now is most people... Uh, when they read the Gospels, they have a really easy time understanding Jesus. People can see what Jesus did. And so the, has anybody read any stories in the Bible that said that Jesus killed somebody or when they came to him, asked for healing, and he said, no, I'm never going to do it. I'm not going to heal you. It's not your time. We will never find that in scriptures. I read through the Gospels many, many times. 
So Jesus did, everything that he did was good. Can everybody agree? Right? And so let's listen to what he says here. So we're going to start. So John 14, verse 9. It says, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. And so this is a key scripture. So who, who has seen Jesus has seen the Father, because Jesus was the perfect representation of Father God. So if you want to know how Father God is, just look at Jesus. And so when I look through all these scriptures and I see all these things that Jesus did, and it made it very simple for me, like, okay, if Jesus is the perfect representation of Father God, then it's really easy for me to see who Father God is. He, Jesus represented him perfect. There were some people on this earth that might have not represented him perfect, that might have done things that were not, you know, they thought maybe God's will, but they weren't. And so this is also what happens today. So a lot of people, when they look at religious people, religious leaders, and when they see them doing something bad, because they think that that's a man of God or a woman of God, and they're doing something bad, so they assume that that's how God is. Why? Because people, you know, the Bible says that we are letters that people are reading. And so when people are looking some, at something that we do bad, and if they tie that to God, so they'll get a perception that God is bad. But... Jesus said that if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So Jesus is the perfect, is the representation of the perfect will and the perfect image of who Father God is. He, has, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So what Jesus was saying, if you don't believe the words that I'm saying, believe the works. And so all of his works were perfect. It says seven times in scriptures that every time that multitudes, when people came to him for healing, he healed everyone. He did not abandon anybody. He had, because, think about this, like he, so he was God walking on earth, so he could have been judging people. He could have said like, oh, 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 yep, you lied to your mom yesterday, so you're going to time out, you're going to have to wait till tomorrow, come back tomorrow, let's try this again. He could have did all of these things. He could have punished people, he could have judged people. He did not do that. He showed the perfect will of the Father, perfect representation of the Father every single time, and he healed every single time. So here's the truth. God wants every single person healed all the time. He wants people to be in divine health. So no sickness, no disease can ever be the will of the Father. Why? Because when Jesus represented him on this earth, he said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, and he showed us an example of what that looks like. So therefore, us, as Jesus on this earth, we should do the same thing. Anytime anybody comes to us for prayer, we should never wonder if they deserve it or if they don't deserve it. Is there sin or is there no sin? Are they in the valley or they're in the mountain? Remove all of these complicated things and just say, here's the gift of God. Every single person that you come across, just give them the gift of the Father, which is life, healing. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. And Jesus represented the perfect will of the Father. And so that really helped me to clear things up. And so when somebody says, uh, well, what about this in the Bible? What about this in the Bible? It's really simple for me. Would Jesus do that? And if Jesus would not do that, then that's not the representation of Father God. Would Jesus not heal somebody? So somebody says like, well, maybe if this is God's will, maybe it's supposed to be in this body. So the question is, if Jesus came across this person, would he not heal him? No, he would heal him right away. So that means that God would heal. That means God is healing just as Jesus did when he was here. Through us, God's will for us to be healing every single person that we come across to show the goodness of God to every people, every single person that's in, our, that's in our life or that's around us. Amen? So if you're ever wondering 
what would God do? Based on the scripture, you can ask, what would Jesus do? And that there is your answer. It makes it really simple. You never have to wonder. Just study the life of Jesus. And so I spent a lot of time just going through the Gospels and just studying Jesus. And he always set the captives free. Every time. He never left anybody abandoned. He never left anybody sick. He never left anybody in the way that they're not supposed to be. He always set them free. Amen? Okay. So the next scripture that I want to go to is Luke 15. So we established who Father God is. So that was the first part. To establish who Father God is, if you still have doubts about him, come to me. I'll give you many more scriptures. But uh, for myself, I established that God is good all the time. And so there is so many scriptures that, you know, like, there is no way that somebody can t- tell me that God is bad based on what I know in the Bible. It would be impossible for somebody. It would, I, it, God himself would have to appear right in front of me and say, son, I'm a horrible father. Stop saying good things about me before I would change my opinion, which I know he's not going to do based on his word. So that means it's not going to happen. So he's a good father. So the issue as people that we have is we have a hard time seeing him as that. And so what I wanted to talk about next is why do some people struggle to see him as a good father? And that might help a lot of people. So we already know biblically that God is good. But when I'm ministering to people, I come across a lot of people that just hate God for some reason. And I always wondered. I remember there was a time we ministered to a lady. Uh, She came in a wheelchair. And she was receiving everything. She was open to everything. But then when it came to unforgiveness, on her form, she said, like, I can't forgive God. And I said, well, God says that you have to forgive. And so she said, she actually yelled out. And she said, I will never forget God. I hate God. I would rather be paralyzed for the rest of my life, but I will never forget God. And she just, you know, took her wheelchair and just rolled out of there. I'm like, whoa, like what in the world did God do to this lady for her to hate him so much? And so we see a lot of people hating God or can't forgive God or are bitter at God or see God in a certain way. And so I've been kind of curious, like why that is. And so this scripture here and just studying more scriptures and ministering to people is helping me to start understanding why some people are so bitter at God. So what we have is we have, in this world, we have people that don't have anything with God. So they were born as an unbeliever. Some of them don't even know God at all. And so they're in the world. So you have that category of people. Then you have another category of people that were born into a Christian family or that knew God or were unbelievers but got saved and then decided they're going to walk away from God. So that's second category. Third category is people that were born into a Christian life or, you know, were born and become into this, get into this religious ritual where you're just doing things and you get into the self-righteous mode. And I think that's the worst place you can be because you think that because you're doing good or you're a good person that God somehow owes you something or, you know, you deserve something or you can demand something from God. And so that's the self-righteous people. So that category was me. So that's a horrible you know, place to be. And so we'll look at it through scripture. So I had to get set free and I'm still learning how to change some of my characteristics of that. So the self-righteous is when you're a religious person and you think because you're a good person, you deserve something and God owes you something. You, 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 you basically, you feel privileged because God owes you something. And so that's the third category. And the fourth category is where we're actually supposed to be, and that is being as Christ. And so when you're in that position, then all your problems go away. And so regardless of which position, if you're category one, two, three, so unsaved, saved but walked away, or self-righteous, all three of those are going to destroy you. And the fourth category that we're supposed to be in is to be as Christ, as have a relationship and be as Jesus Christ and have a relationship with Father God. So we're going to kind of go through these couple of categories here. So we're going to talk about category two and category three, which a lot of people can see themselves in. So because if you're a person that does not even know God, then, I mean, 
you're just you're not saved. So I mean, you pretty much have to get saved, and you go from that category all the way to the fourth category, which is being as Christ, have a relationship uh, with Christ, and through Christ you come uh, to Father God. So Luke 15. Starting in verse 11. And it's a parable about the lost son. But there is, here's the interesting part. When I was a religious person, I related myself to the second guy. And I was so proud of myself, like, how dare this guy just walk away from God like that? But then I realized that, man, that, that second, that other position is really bad too. It took me a while to figure that out. So 11. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. So in the Jewish culture, basically when the father dies, the younger son gets a third of everything that the father has, and the older son gets two-thirds. And so if a son for some reason decides like he's done, he gets in a fight with his father. So their culture allowed them to, they can come to the father and say, okay, I'm moving out. So the father would have to give him the third of everything he owned. So this younger son came to the father and said, give me what, what's mine. And so father gave him the third of what was his, of his livelihood. And 13, it's verse 13. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. So just a quick picture. So you have a father, you have two sons, two sons that they're, they're living together um, in the city or whatever. And so the younger one, which was, you know, he was saved, he decided that I don't want to live with my father anymore. I don't want to be in my father's will. So I'm just taking my stuff and I'm going away. I'm leaving. And so he got his stuff and he took off. The other son stayed there and continued working. So the older son stayed there, continued working. Younger son packed up his stuff, left, you know, and went away into a faraway land. Verse 14. But when he had spent all... There arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in a want. So he took all of his stuff and just blew it. And that's what happens. We see this happen with many people. So somebody that was in God, and for some reason, they decided to walk away. And so what we notice is if you actually build a relationship with God, so if you go into category number four, and I'm just using this as an example. There is no categories. I mean, like if you're in category four as an example, where you're in the relationship, when you are saved and you are in the true relationship with Father God, it'd be very hard for you to walk away. God says, test me, experience me. So if you experience Father God for who he is and you build a relationship with him, I typically don't see those kind of people walking away. Typically, the people that we see walking away are people that are religious, that are self-righteous, or that are living, you know, based on how good they do. And so they don't have a relationship. They don't ever develop a relationship with Father God, and so they don't know for who He is. Because I truly believe that if this younger son, if he had a real relationship with his father, he would have never walked away. And so whatever he had, he blew it. And so we see the same thing happening today. People that their life was going good, when they go into the world for a while, they party, they have fun, but then eventually they lose everything. Why? The Bible is very clear. The devil came to steal, kill, and destroy. So if you join his kingdom, it's just a matter of time, you're going to lose everything. So if you have plans to do that, I'm going to tell you the end result, you're going to lose everything. So don't even try it. So because a lot of people think like, okay, and I used to think that. I remember when I was a kid going to a religious church, I used to think, like, these people say one thing. Their life is completely different. I don't see anything in their life that I see in the Bible. And so I used to question. There was a time, I think, when I was 15 or 16 years old, when I was really close to just walking away from God altogether because I was tormented because I would see a God in the Bible that was one way, 
but then I would see my life and other people's life that had nothing to do with the Bible. And so everything was this works, you know, like self-righteousness, like, you know, I'm good, you know, like I'm bad, I'm this. And I was basing everything based on what I was doing and nothing to do with who God was or what he wanted to do with me and with my life. And so a lot of people, they're in this state and then eventually the world sounds like it's a lot better place. And so a lot of my friends, most people, more, most guys that I grew up with um, in that church, they went into the world. Most of them are already dead. Some of them are hardcore drug addicts to where they're unrecognizable. And so every single one of them that had anything lost everything. There's only one guy that I know that I grew up with at that time. He, he was like the second kid, second son. He was self-righteous and he's still that way. I've been talking to him recently. And so he's been kind of like opening up a little bit. He's like, I am already, you know, over 40 years old. All my kids are in the world. Whatever I believe is not working. He's like, is there something different? So he's finally, after 40 years of searching for the truth, but his self-righteousness at least kept him in church, you know, till now. He didn't walk away and destroy his life. So people that go into the kingdom of the devil, the end result is you lose everything. So there is no other way. You cannot be in the kingdom of the devil and have everything. You might have it temporarily. You might have a lot of riches. You might have a lot of fun. You might have a lot of friends. But once you don't have any money, once you've blown everything, you're not going to have any friends because the only friends that you can have in this world are the ones that are looking for something from you. They're looking for you to pay for them or to give them something. But once you blow everything and you don't have anything, those friends are going to go away. And so that's what happened with the younger son. So he went out with all this money, started partying, and then he lost everything, lost all of his friends. And if that's not bad enough, listen to what happens next. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. So think about this. The guy lived in the kingdom. His father was a king. He had everything, everything that he could imagine. He had the best clothes, the best food. He could do whatever he wants. He had all of that. He went away, lost everything, and then when he wanted something, the best that he could do, the best that the devil could offer him is pig food. So when I was a kid, I grew up in Ukraine. My grandma had some pigs in the backyard. That was the one place that I never played. Why? Because it smelled so horrible over there, I couldn't even get close to it. If my grandma told me, like, you know, hey, go check on the pigs, I would cry not wanting to go there. That's how bad it was. So this guy went from being living as, you know, as a child of a king to living with the pigs. That's a horrible deal. Would you guys agree? So who would want that? Why would somebody want to give up what they have with God and go and live with the pigs? That's a horrible idea. But so many people do it. And so it's not a good deal. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. And no one gave him anything. So it got so bad for this guy that they would not even allow him to eat the pig's food. So think about it. You go from being the son of a king to being going so low where they decided that the pigs are more important. So the pigs got the food that they ate, but this guy could not even have the food that the pigs ate. I mean, how much worse can it get? So he was not even allowed to eat the food that the pigs were eating. That's how bad it was. And that's what the devil offers. That's the end result of if we follow what he says. 17. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? So he realized, he remembered how it used to be. So it, something, you know, Holy Spirit brought it to his remembrance, and so when we minister to people, a lot of people that were in the world that left, they come back and they just say, like, finally something clicked. Like, okay, I'm done with this life. I don't want to have anything to do with this life anymore. I want to go back to the Father. I want to return to the life that belongs to me. And so this is what happened with the younger son. 18. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. 
and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he, in his heart, he thought that things are so bad that I probably don't deserve to be you know, this, a son again. And so I'd be gladly, he was willing to go back and to be a servant, to be a slave in his father's kingdom, because a slave in his father's kingdom was getting better treatment than where he was at. And so like in his mind, he was just trying to just to get into anything. But that's a lie. There is no slaves in the kingdom of God. God can never make you a slave. But this guy was just willing to do anything because of how bad his life was. So verse 20, it says, And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. So this is a good picture of like why Father God is so good. So he had a son that betrayed him, walked away from him, took a third of the kingdom, blew it, wasted it, just throw it away and decided to come back. And what does the father do? He runs to him and has compassion on him and kisses him. So that is a good father. So if we think of it from a world's perspective, how many of us, if your child did something really, really, really bad, like took a third of your everything you have and blew it, destroyed it, destroyed their life and come back, you would at least sit down with him, okay, like we're going to have a talk first, right? There's no way you're just going to be like, hey, no problem, no worries. Give me a hug, I'll kiss you. Most of us would not do that. So it proves that how much better our Father God is than we are as people. So he, had, he showed compassion to him. He showed love to him. He went, he didn't even, he overlooked everything that he did. And so what Father God is saying to us today, if you're in a position where you walked away from God, God doesn't care what you did. He could care less what, how much you destroyed of your life, what happened. He is ready to accept you the way you are. He didn't start going off at him, then tell him like how bad you are, you know, like you don't deserve this. You're going to start, have to start doing this. You're going to have to work your way back in. He didn't do any of that. He went right for him. But here's another key point that a lot of people miss. The father, where was the father this whole time? He was near his kingdom. The father did not leave everything and start looking through the pigsties where he was. Do you guys, did you guys catch that? Really important. So the father is always in his kingdom. So the only way that this son was able to get back into the kingdom is he had to decide. He had to use his will to decide that he's going to come back. So Father God can never do anything against our will. Because a lot of people say, like, well, how would God allow this person was a Christian, and how would God allow all these bad things to happen to the person? No, the person chose to take everything that God provided and go away with it and destroy it. God was not chasing him over there. God can never go against our will. We have to decide, okay, I'm done with this life. I no longer want to eat with the pigs. I want to get back to the Father. And only when he decided and he came back to the Father, then the Father was able to receive him. So the Father is not going to be going around searching for us in pigsties. We see that clearly in the Bible. What that means is he cannot go against our will because a lot of people think that they're just going to live this life and you know, they're still going to be saved and they're, st they're going to serve the devil and somehow still serve God. It doesn't work like that. You're either in the kingdom of the devil or you're in the kingdom of God, one or the other, and you decide that by your will. So decision is behind every single person and God cannot go against our will. That's really important to understand. 21, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. 
and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be married. They began to party. So just to recap the picture. So the younger son went away, destroyed his life, destroyed a lot of his father's stuff. He took a third of the kingdom, destroyed it, blew it, decided, I'm done with this life, came back, and he came back. The father restored him to the fullness. He restored him to the way he was. And this is what, so Jesus was using this parable to explain what will happen to us. It doesn't matter how bad we messed up. It doesn't matter how much bad things we did. What we did in the past, if we come back to the Father, He restores us to the fullness. He restores us to the fullness of what? What does He restore us to? To Jesus Christ. That fourth category that I was talking about. So He restores us to the fullness, to the Jesus Christ. And He sees us when we have a relationship with Him, when we come to Him through Jesus... He sees us the same way as he sees Jesus. He will never look back at our life and say like, well, you did this over there or you messed up that over there. Because many times what happens, we see people come back to Christ, uh, get saved, their life getting restored, and then they start getting condemned. And then they think that God is telling them or condemning them about their past. No. Who will remember your past? The devil. Why? Because he's a liar. The Bible says that the God will never remember your sins. He will never, he wipes them away. So when you come to him, you get saved, you give your life to him, you start fresh, brand new, as if you have never sinned before. And he makes you righteous the same way as Jesus. So there is no difference between you and Jesus when you become a son and daughter of God. That's what he has for us. And so that's what he did. He restored the son that left into this fullness of Jesus Christ. Verse 25. So now it turns to the other son. And his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed a fat calf, but he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these days, years, I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as your son, this, the son of yours came, who was devoured, who has devoured, devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted cow for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. Is what right that we should make merry and be glad? For your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. And so, so many people, like I said, so I used to be in this category. And this is what drove me to a spot to where I almost walked away from God. So I went, I was born in a Christian family. And so I thought I was a Christian. I tried to do everything right. I came to church on Sundays. I came to church on Wednesdays, whatever. I mean, I came to, I did everything that I was supposed to do. And my life was really boring. Why? Because I was doing things because I had to. I was doing all these rituals. I never experienced, I never had a relationship with God. And when I would see somebody that would get saved and all of a sudden they got more attention, I would get jealous. I'm like, hey, this guy was a sinner out there in the world, and he came back, and all of a sudden he's important, and I've been going to church for 15 years, and nobody even recognizes me. That's the self-righteousness. So many believers or so many Christians are in that state. And so for people that are in that state, you also have to repent and you have to get out of that state, and you had to get in the state and to save into Jesus Christ. Why? Because if you're counting on what you did, if you're looking at your works, if you're looking at whatever you did is what's going to get you there, you're going to be very disappointed. I share testimonies a lot of times when we minister to people that are older, where 
I would look at their life as a perfect example, and then when they'd be dying, we'd go pray for them. They would grab me by the shirt and say, Vitaly, don't let me die. And I would say, why not? Aren't you ready to go see Jesus? They would say, no, I don't know where I'm going. Why? Because their whole life, they lived a self-righteousness life. They thought that because they went to church on Sunday, because they prayed three times a day, because they sang this many times, because they you know, fed the hungry, because they you know, did this and that and that, that that's what's going to get him into heaven. That is self-righteousness. That's what the second son was. I never even, when I read this story, when I was that guy, when I read that story, I always thought like I was proud of this guy because I related to him because that's who I was. And then I had to, God had to show me that I'm not even saved. Even though I'm around all of this, I'm, I'm around all of this stuff, but I'm not even enjoying the kingdom. And so I had to repent and I had to decide and say, okay, it doesn't matter what I have done. The only thing that matters is what Jesus has done. And so when I decided that because Jesus has paid the, paid the price and because I received salvation as a gift, that is the only reason that I'm righteous. Things got really simple for me. Because before I strived, I tried to do all of these things, you know, and try to be this good Christian person. And the harder that I tried, the more disappointed I was. And it was a horrible, horrible experience. And then when I gave my life to Jesus and decided that I'm righteous because Jesus is righteous, I'm righteous because he has made me righteous, and it's no longer because of what I do, it's because of what he did, my life became very simple. I don't have to worry about that. I just get to enjoy my life because I know that the life that he has given me as a gift, and now I'm living a life not to perform, to receive something from him, but from a position because of who I already am. Because I'm a son of God, I get to enjoy being a son. So just like the younger kid, when he repented, he got his life restored, he was able to party and have fun. Do you think when he was partying, do you think he was thinking about the pigs or, or him getting all that bad stuff? No. He was enjoying being with the father, being back where he's supposed to be, having fun. Why? Because that was his life. That's where he was supposed to be. Yet this other son, the older son, living there his whole life, doing all of these things, he was grumpy and he didn't even want to be there. Why? Because he was so jealous and, and bitter of what happened. And so back to what I was saying in the beginning. So what happens is I want to share um, a couple of stories. Uh, we were ministering to this one girl. Uh, this is in a different state, so I can share the story because nobody knows her. She was Christian, and then she fell away and went into the world. And a lot of bad stuff happened to her, and she came to one of these ser one service, and so we started ministering to her, and we prayed for her. She gave her life to Jesus. She was able to receive him, and she was able to, even though she had some bitterness towards God because she thought God was doing some stuff, she was able to forgive herself for what she did and forgive God and easily be with the Father. Another girl that we minister to in a different state, she was the self-righteous girl. She tried to do everything right, but a lot of really bad stuff started happening in her life. She went to church and her mom decided to take her to a different country and things started falling apart, so she started becoming really bitter with her mother, really angry with her mother, and because she was taught, because the mom told her, like, well, this is God's will for us. We're obviously not meant to live here. If we're moving here, that's God's will. And so because the mom was telling her that everything that she was doing was God's will, this girl started to get really, really bitter at God. By the time she got 25, she was so bitter at God that her body started falling apart. And she got so sick to where she was dying. And then um, somehow, somewhere she got married. And then so she kind of, she improved a little bit. And so the doctors told her, you're going to die any year. And so she continued living. And then somehow she was able to have a kid. It's a miracle. Uh, she doesn't even know how she was able to do that. And then so she kind of uh, continued living. And so when we ministered to her, she was 32. So for seven years, she, she was dying. And when we started talking to her, 
she said that in my head I understand that these things are not supposed to happen. But it's so ingrained in me, and I believe this so hard that all of these things are happening because this is God's will. I'm so angry at God, I cannot forgive God. And so we started praying for her. And as we started praying for her, she struggled. She struggled. She cried and she cried in her, in her head. She agreed that she needs to repent and come back to Father God. But yet she could not do it because that bitterness was holding her back. And so we were praying with her and ministering to her. And so after about two hours, she was able to do it. She was able to forgive God. And when she did that, she broke down, started crying. And she started getting delivered and getting set free. Things were twisting like her. There was issues with her intestines and her stomach. As we were ministering to her, we were seeing like these demons coming out. And so they were, they were coming out, leaving her body. You could see her stomach and everything like physically twisting, just all kinds of stuff happening. Stuff was leaving her. And so she was able to get out of that self-righteous state and get back and restore her life and go back to the state that God wanted her to be. And so what is God's plan? What does God want for us today? We know that it's not being unsaved at all. We know it's not being the person that was saved and walk away. We know it's not the self-righteous person. So what God the Father provided for us is for us to come to him through Jesus Christ. And so I'm wrapping up here. So let's quickly go through to, sorry, to John 14, 6. And it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So a lot of people are trying to come, the self-righteous people are trying to come to God by their works, trying to earn it, trying to deserve it. And so, but Jesus said that nobody can come to the Father except through him. So the only way that you can come to the Father, the only way you can become a child, a son, and a daughter of God is through Jesus Christ. That is the only way. So that is the path. Next scripture, let's go to John 1, 12. And this explains the how. So John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So I just read that the only way to the Father, the only way into a true relationship with Father God is through Jesus Christ. There is no other ways. There is no other religions, uh, nothing being good, self-righteousness, nothing will get you into a relationship with Father God. The only way is through Jesus Christ, and He is the way, the life, and the truth. So the only way to the Father is through Jesus Christ, and the way to do it, the how, is to receive Him as your Lord and as your Savior. And so when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior by believing, just by agreeing that you can become a child of His, and just literally, that's it is. That's how simple it is. Just by believing what God's Word says, that you, through Jesus Christ, receive this life, the eternal life, this relationship of God. And it's a gift. If you want to receive it as something that you have to work for, it will never work. That will lead you into the self-righteousness. The only way that you can have this relationship with God is by a gift. And that's what me, most people struggle with because most of us are trained and are brought up to be always on performance based. And so we have a really hard time receiving something from God. We think that we have to do something so hard. We have to fast enough. We have to you know, pray enough, we have to worship enough, we have to confess enough, we have to do this, that. No, it says by receiving, by believing. So Jesus is the way, and the how is by believing, by receiving him as your Lord and your Savior. That is your relationship. And so what I had to do for myself when I was 25 years old, I thought I was saved my whole life. 
I thought I was a Christian, but what I learned is I was just the self-righteousness fool uh, thinking that I was saved. And then I gave my life to Jesus, and I received him in a way as a gift. And when, I, when that happened, everything changed in me because I stopped trying to perform. I stopped trying to please God and just started to believe him what he said about Jesus. And so my closing scripture that I want to read right now, and I've seen this scripture help so many people. So it's in Luke 3, verse 22, and it says this. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved son. And so what Father God is telling you as a child of God, not, you know, to a crowd, but by faith he wants you to receive. So this is what he said to Jesus. And when you become his child, you become as Jesus. So when he speaks to you, he speaks to you as if he would to Jesus. And this is what he's telling you. This is what I repeat to myself all the time. If, I, if the devil ever tries to question my identity, this is the scripture that I use. And he said, You are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. You are my beloved son and daughter, in you I am well pleased. This is the truth. So if the devil is telling you you're a bad person, you're this and that, what God is saying is if you are his child, he's saying, you are my beloved son and daughter in whom I am well pleased. So what that means is that he loves you and he is happy with you, just as he is with Jesus. Why? Because that's what he said to Jesus, and the Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. Because when we get saved, we become as Jesus Christ. And so when, G when God looks at us, he sees no difference between us and Jesus. And when you get that revelation, everything changes. Why? Because you're able to just believe and receive as Jesus would and live your life as Jesus. And because you're already as Jesus, then you start doing all the good works. It doesn't mean that you sit on the sofa and do nothing for the rest of your life, which a lot of people fall into that lie. You're able to, when Jesus was on this earth, what was he doing? He was doing the works of the Father. Why was he doing them? Because he was a son. Was Jesus doing any of those things to try to prove something to Father God? No. Was he doing any of those works to deserve something or to earn salvation or anything from God? No. He was able to do those things because he was a son and a daughter. So in the spirit realm, there is no daughter. So that's why, you know, everything refers to a son. But when I say son, it applies to both, to male and female. So when God looks at us, and I just, I want everybody to close your eyes right now. I think this is really important because I know a lot of people struggle. When we minister to people, people struggle with identity. People struggle with condemnation. People struggle with who they are. People struggle whether or not they're saved or not. And so the devil is filling people up with lies and just all of these things that throw us off. Tim, maybe if you can turn on the worship a little bit. As you have your eyes closed, repeat after me. I am your beloved son in whom you are well pleased. Repeat again. I am your beloved son in whom you are well pleased. Okay? And just keep your eyes closed and just, holy, I just, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit just to start revealing to you what that means because I think it's really important for every person to get that revelation. What does that mean to you? Right now, God does not want you to worry about your sins. He does not want to worry for you to worry about your past, the things that you have done. He does not care about any of those things. Right now, He just wants you to hear 
and agree, receive what he's saying to you because he said this to Jesus and he's saying this to you right now. And I want us to repeat this again. I am your beloved son in whom you are well pleased. I am your beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And just keep your eyes closed right now. And so I'm just going to pray over everybody. Now. Father God, I thank you that you're an amazing Father. Father, what you have done for us, none of us can imagine. The love that you have for us is indescribable. The love that we experience at our best is just a drop in the ocean of how much you love us. What you did for us. You gave up your only son, Jesus, to come into this earth and to pay the price for us to be in divine health, for us to be in perfect peace, and for us to be forgiven. Jesus died on the cross. He paid the price for all of our sins and made us righteous. He died, he was resurrected, and now he is seated in heavenly places with you. And as your children, we have the right to sit in heavenly places with you as Jesus Christ. Not because we deserve it, not because we earned it, but it's a gift that we receive. When we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, in this package, we have the life and life abundant. And we have a relationship with you. The same relationship that you have with Jesus, you want to have with us. So everybody continue keeping your eyes closed. So I talked about four different categories of people. First category is if you're not saved, you've never been a believer, you're in the world and you don't know who Father God is. God is calling you. He wants you to become his child. He wants you to have life and life abundant. And he's willing to accept you as you are. He doesn't care about your past. The next category is if you were once in the body of Christ and then something happened and you walked away, you blew everything, you destroyed your life, you're guilty, you're condemned, you're unworthy, you think that there's no more forgiveness, you think that there's no more life for you. You think that it's over. The devil is telling you it's over. Just end your life. Nobody cares about you. Nobody loves you. God can never forgive you. But God is telling you right now that's a lie. He's willing to accept you as you are and throw a big party for you and to celebrate with you in his kingdom. Third category is if you were self-righteous, and what that means is if you've been, you think you've been doing everything good, but you're always thinking that you're not good enough. No matter what you do, no matter how hard you try, you always feel like it's not good enough and that God's not happy with you. And so God wants you to come to him right now and just receive him as a gift that's free. and your life will change forever. And so if you're in one, any of those three categories, I want everybody else to keep your eyes closed. I want everybody just to jump up to your feet right now. Keep your eyes closed. I want to give everybody on this Father's Day, God wants to give every person an opportunity. If you're not in a relationship with God, if you don't see yourself as Jesus and you want your life to change, regardless of where you're at in your life, God wants to 
drastically change your life right now. The Bible says the day of salvation is now. If you've been putting it off, right now is the time. God is calling your heart. So if you're one of those people, I just ask you, just, no, I want everybody to, if everybody can stand up, I want everybody to get up on your feet right now. Keep your eyes closed. If you're in one of those three categories and you want your life to change, what I ask you to do right now is just raise your hand and our ministers are gonna come up to you and just minister you right now. Everybody else, keep your eyes closed. Don't wonder what everybody else is doing right now. I want every single person to focus. It's right now, it's between you and God. If there's anybody here that wants to change their life, Father God wants to give you this opportunity right now. If that's you, just raise your hand and your life will change forever. And ministers will come up to you. So if everybody else, keep your eyes closed. I'm just going to pray, Holy Spirit, right now in Jesus' name, I ask you that you touch every heart. Your word says that you bring people to repentance. You bring people to Jesus. Right now, Holy Spirit, I ask you that you just touch every heart, regardless of where they're at in their lives. In Jesus' name, Father, I thank you. You're an amazing Father. That you love us as you love Jesus. You love us the same way. When you look at us, you're smiling, you're happy, you're rejoicing when you see us. You're more excited to see us than we can ever imagine. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Jesus name. So... There is nobody else. And what we're gonna do next right now is we're gonna do a test. So continue keeping your eyes closed. I just want the Holy Spirit to continue working with you. So the test that we do is the Bible says that for those that are in Christ, we're seated in heavenly places. And so, if you have condemnation, it is very difficult for you to see yourself as seated in heavenly places. And so what we did with the girl, the way that girl that was um, the one that left God, that was a Christian left God, the way that she was able to test for herself and receive her healing is what we had her do is just to repeat that scripture. I'm your beloved daughter in whom you are well pleased. And as she was started saying that, she started getting healed. She started getting, uh, just she started crying, and just started getting set free. And then after a little bit of time, she was able to jump, to see herself jump into Father God's lap or however you want to see yourself or just jump up to him and hug him and be able to come together with him. And so the way to test to see if you're in that relationship of God that you're supposed to be is if you're able to do that. So what I practice for myself all the time, I practice to be able to see myself seated with him to be able to, even though I'm an adult, but I have no problem to see myself as his child and just jump in his lap and just hang on his neck and just hug him. And that's where I receive the love that I need. 
the love that I cannot receive from other people because He is our love. He is the only one. It says that He is the Father to the fatherless. He is the only one that's able to do that. And so as the worship music is going right now, everybody continue keeping your eyes closed. Don't open your eyes. I just want you to see yourself to jump into the Father God's arms. Again, if you want to see yourself as an adult, you can just run up to him and just hug him. If you want to see yourself as a child, jump into his lap and just hug him. But are you able to see Father God as someone that's close, as someone that's loving, as someone that is your father that you have a relationship with? And so with the girl that was self-righteous, the girl that was really sick, that was really messed up, that had a lot of bitterness and unforgiveness towards God, what she discovered is that when she would close her eyes and she would try to imagine Father God, she would see a blank space. She could not even see Father God. But as we were praying, she started to see him at a distance. And as she continued praying, as she continued just to cry and just continue, and all she was doing, she was repeating the truth. She was believing, even though she didn't understand how it works, but she was continuing to repeat, I'm your beloved daughter in whom you are well pleased. I'm your beloved daughter in whom you are well pleased. And she just kept repeating that, repeating that, crying. And then she would start seeing in the distance, Father God would start appearing to her. And then he got really close to her. And then the devil would tell her, like, he still doesn't love you. But she continued to stand on the truth. Why? Because the Bible says that the truth will set you free. And what happened finally, she got really close to him and she just touched his robe a little bit. But then she got scared and she, you know, she ran back. And Holy Spirit showed me and I saw a vision. She just closed her eyes and just by faith, she just ran as hard as she could. And just when she got next to him, she just jumped up and just dove into him. And then the enemy could not stop her. And that's when she was able to do that in her imagination. She just stepped back and just ran as hard as she could by faith and just jumped into Father God's lap and was set free. And I talked to her the day after and she said, this is the best she's ever felt. She's never experienced so much peace so much joy because now she knows that her and father are one. She knows that she can be in his arms. She can hug him no matter what's going on around her, no matter you know how bad things are, she knows that she's with the father and she's one with him. And so our father God is the best father in the universe. And he wants a relationship with every single person here. And so what we're gonna do right now, we're gonna do something a little bit different in our prayer. So what we're going to do is we're just going to, I'm going to have you continue repeating after me and continue repeating after me. And I want you just by faith. And if you're already in the right place and you already experienced this, and this, you know, this is something that you already do, that's praise God. But I want to give the opportunity for people that have never done that to be able to break that barrier, to break that distance, to break that separation. And before you leave here, that you're able to jump into his lap, that you're able to get close to him and hug him and feel and know that you're one with him by faith. And so I'm gonna have everybody, we're gonna start repeating. Worship music is gonna crank it up a little bit louder, just a little bit, and we're gonna continue repeating. And we're gonna just repeat it. We're gonna go louder and louder and louder and louder and louder. And if you're there, if you get into the spot where you're already there, then just enjoy that time and just start thanking him, asking him questions, start communicating with him. But the people that are still trying to get there, we're gonna continue repeating. And we're going to continue by faith getting into that spot where there's nothing between you and Father God. 
He already did everything that he can ever do for you. And so now it's our turn. Now it's our turn because he deserves it. He deserves our relationship with him because he did everything that he was supposed to do from his end. So let's start repeat after me. I am your beloved son in whom you are well pleased. And if you're a girl and you want to say daughter, that's fine. Whatever, like you can say son, daughter, whatever you feel. I'm going to keep, I can't go back and forth. So I'm going to keep saying son. But if you want to say daughter, say that. But just, we're going to start intensifying. We're going to start saying it louder and louder until you see yourself there. I am your beloved son in whom you are well pleased. I am your beloved son in whom you are well pleased. I am your beloved son in whom you are well pleased. Now start saying that out of your spirit as you mean it. Your spirit is in your belly, so start saying it with authority like you mean it. I am your beloved son in whom you are well pleased. I am your beloved son in whom you are well pleased. I am your beloved son in whom you are well pleased. I am your beloved son in whom you are well pleased. So we're just gonna take a couple of minutes right now. Just continue your eyes closed. And if you wanna, if you feel tears in your eyes and you wanna cry, just let it go, it's okay. Just experience his closeness. The Bible says that he's always there with us. He's always in us. It's just that we were never taught how to experience, how to practically live that out, how to practically be close to him and how to experience him. every heart right now. Heal every wound in Jesus' name. Every wound is getting healed right now. Every pain is getting healed right now. In Jesus' name. All sorrow is going away in Jesus' name. 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 Holy Spirit, I ask you that you reveal Father God to every person here right now. That every single person experiences the love of Father God. In Jesus' name. So, if you were able to easily, or maybe it was hard, but you were able to get there, so everybody continue to keep your eyes closed. I don't want anybody to feel uncomfortable because right now this is between us and God. I don't want anybody to be embarrassed. I don't want anybody to be ashamed. If you already experienced and you feel at ease going into his arms, into his lap, 
Just raise your hand right now. I just want to see how many poor people are still not experiencing it right now. Because I want to make sure before everybody leaves that everybody able is able to experience that. Okay. Is there anybody still here who still feels like they can't, they can't break the barrier, they can't, they don't feel comfortable, they don't feel worth, they, they don't feel that they're good enough to be able to do that. If that's still you, please raise your hand because I want to continue praying, continue repeating till everybody experience. Is there anybody here that is still not able to experience closeness with Father God? If it's you, just raise your hand. Don't be afraid, it's okay. You're around children of God and we're here to help one another. So what we're going to do right now is just I'll just have ministers come up to the people that raise your hand. Everybody else, keep your eyes closed. So whoever raised your hand just here, raise, keep your hand up so people and ministers can come up to you. And I'm going to walk you through a prayer. So, but we're all going to repeat that prayer just so the people that raise their hand don't feel uncomfortable. Father God, I come to you right now and I say, please forgive me all of my sins, past, current, future. I thank you that I am forgiven. I'm making a conscious decision to make Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Jesus, come into my heart and become my Lord and my Savior. And by faith, I'm receiving the gift of salvation. And I thank you, Father, that right now, when you're looking at me, you see me perfect, blameless. You see me as Jesus Christ. And you accept me as Jesus Christ. All of my past has been wiped away. I have no more condemnation. I am righteous. When I come to you, I come to you as perfect as Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so right now, we're going to repeat again. I just want people that just prayed the prayer to be able to experience that. I thank everybody else that already experienced that, that you're uh, helping us out here. So repeat after me. I am your beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I am your beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I am your beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to, for those of you that already experienced um, and you, you're in the right place, you're just going to worship right now, continue to keep your eyes closed, um, or you can pray in tongues. But I want the ministers to be around those people to continue ministering and praying for those people right now until they're able to see themselves in the spot where they're able to come close to Jesus right now. Everybody else, so Tim's just going to attempt. Can you turn on that uh, the Yeshua sound, please? We're just going to pray in tongues and worship. So if you can pray in tongues, pray in tongues. If you do not know how to pray in tongues, just sing along with the song, but keep your eyes closed. And just um, with your imagination, though, as you're praying tongues, we're not going to pray really loud. I want you to raise your hand, and I want you just to start thanking Father God for who He is. Praise Him. And just continue to experience His outpouring love to you right now. Because right now, Father God wants to just 
flood us. Right now you will experience the flood of His love just flowing through your whole being. You will experience something that you might have never experienced before. But just start, we're not going to be very aggressive, just start praying in tongues. And people that have not experienced yet, ministers, I ask you to continue ministering to them until they experience it. Hare lari gurila hara gurila hara lari gurila haru lari gurila hari gurila lari lari gurila Holy Spirit I ask you right now that you just release Father God's love into every single person here